This is an exciting time in Scotland's story and understanding our past will help us determine our future. And when Scotland's voice is heard, it charts the way forward. This is Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmond. Welcome to Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmond once again at our premier broadcast time of 10am on a Saturday morning. A for the football. Yes, a for the football as Alex rightly and always says and indeed <laughs> before the usual family outings that many like me are no doubt used to. Now, I shall let Alex let you know what we have in store for you today. For some time the political establishment have been comforting themselves that the, the days of mass political protests were, were largely over. Of course you get environmental activism, people super gluing themselves to road signs and so forth, causing the traffic to be blocked and all that sort of stuff. But basically they thought that the, the days of 100,000 and more on the streets on a regular basis, the days of the poll tax of 35 years ago, the protests against the Iraq war of 20 years ago, they thought these days were over. But then came the slaughter of the innocents in Gaza and street protest was back. So much so that parliamentary debates are ostensibly rigged because of it. The protests about the Middle East have been telling and have helped turn around the public mood in relation to the conflict. For today's big interview, we turn to none other than Tommy Sheridan, that master of political protest and the most high profile figure in the poll tax demonstrations of 35 years ago. Before we hear from Alex and Tommy, for our younger viewers, here's a quick reminder of the poll tax protests. Well, Tommy Sheridan, welcome to Scotland Speaks with Alex Sam. It's a great pleasure, Alex. Great pleasure. Now, looking at some of these pictures, uh, it's, it's difficult for me to remember. It's 35 years, 35 years since the, the poll tax demonstrations. Did you ever wake up in the morning and say it was really that time ago? Alex, um, one thing I do do is look at those demonstrations and remember when I had a bit of hair on my head. <laughs> uh, I used to, believe it or not, have uh, long locks when we were leading the anti-poll tax campaign. But you remember those days with a great deal of affection, Alex, because that's when protest actually achieved something. Because... Protest is so important in people's lives. The, the day we stop protesting, Alex, is the day we roll over and we, and we play dead. But the poll tax was unique, in my opinion, in that Thatcher, up until then, had divided and conquered. She'd picked the nurses, she'd picked the steel workers, she'd picked the printers, she'd picked the miners, and she went after them all separately. The poll tax, okay, she did try and divide and conquer in it. She went for the Scots first before England and Wales. But all of Scotland was attacked. And that gave us the opportunity 
to get people in Scotland to say, hey, we've got to stand up and we've got to fight back. We'd already rejected her three times, Alec, as you know, 79, 83, 87. Elections were doing nothing for us. Words were absolutely useless. We needed action, and that's where the mass non-payment campaign came in. So at what stage then, thinking about these years, the, did you sense that this wasn't one of the issues that come along in politics that catch the, the mood of the moment? This was going to be something which would which would effectively bring down the Prime Minister who up until then had reigned supreme. There's no way any of us could anticipate, Alec, the way you would set this whole movement alight and it would take uh, uh, um, flames that would engulf the whole of England, Wales and Scotland. There's no way we knew because let's be honest and people need to take encouragement from this. The early anti-poll tax meetings were 20 and 30. Sure, within a few months, they became two and three hundred, but they started small and then it grew. And it grew because people were in poverty. I, I've made the point so many times, Alan, and I'm sure you have as well, that although we like to think that we were recruiting sergeants to the anti-poll tax campaign, the single biggest recruiting sergeant was poverty itself. People needed to fight, but at the start of the campaign, Alex, you'll remember that you were there, uh, from my opinion, it gave the SNP a great deal of credibility because they were prepared to stand on the side of the people, unlike the Labour Party, who wanted to stand on the side of so-called respectability. It was the law, as if they couldn't learn from history. Apartheid was the law, denying blacks in America, the vote was the law. Being legal was not moral. And what we had to try and go over to people was that breaking the law through mass civil disobedience with the poll tax, you weren't going to stand alone. But it was all you had left because we tried the petitions, we tried the voting, we'd marched, they wouldn't listen. All we had left was your civil disobedience. Now, you were particularly famous during the, the campaign for organising groups of people to resist the sheriff officers. They were coming to pin the, the goods of people who weren't paying their poll tax. Uh, and you had, and where did you get your inspiration from that, from the history in Glasgow? Well, mostly um, from my, my mum, um, Alice, um, God rest her soul, and we Betty McCracken from Govan, who was a stalwart of the Govan Community Council. She was an absolute expert on Mary Barber and the rent strikes of 1915 in Glasgow, particularly Govan and Mary Hill. And when the sheriff officers were sent in to try and evict the rent strikers, and we won't go into the whole protest of that, but it was a fantastic campaign when the sheriff officers turned up all of the community, all of the women in particular, because they led the campaign, they would get the bin lids out, they would get the bags of flour, they would get some urine and some uh, excrement, and they would chase the sheriff officers away. And we took our inspiration from what they did in 1915. We said to ourselves, we can do it in 1989 and 1990. Um, and again, although I, I suppose, got notoriety because I was arrested a few times, it has to be re reminded that the women led that campaign of resistance. I mean, there was one day up in um, Postle Park, Alex, um, where the sheriff officers tried a remarkable uh, 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 feat. They were going to pin over 400 people in the one day. Uh, and we, these were on the high-rise flats up in, in Postle. So that was a Red mass Road. pending. Mass pending, mass pending. And we organised, we called ourselves the poll tax busters. We took, you know, we were using wee gimmicks to get ourselves well known. We wee stickers with the, the poll tax busters with the wee ghost in it, taking uh, inspiration for the, the Ghostbusters movie. Who are you going to call poll tax busters? Um, and we managed to, on that day, mobilise a thousand people in a, in a housing scheme of Glasgow to stop every single pending. Now, I think 40 or 50 of us were arrested, um, where some of us were arrested very early. But the protesters marched to the police station, demanded a release, and later that night we were all released and not one single pending took place. And that was so important, Alec, because it spread like wildfire. We didn't have the social media that there is now. All we had was phones. 
but we used the phones effectively. We had phone trees set up, Alex, so that we had 10 people in a phone tree, but those 10 people were to phone 10 other people, and those 10 other people phoned another 10 people. Before you knew it, you're getting 1,000 people uh, contacted, and that's the way the campaign worked. Very, very grassroots. Now, I've got two questions before we move on to other protests. One, the, the, there was a difference in nature between the, the, the mass protest in Scotland as expressed at the huge rallies and what happened uh, uh, in a later campaign which was just gathering strength as the poll tax came to, to England. How do you explain that? It's an interesting um, feature of, of the Scottish psyche and the Scottish protest, Alex. We expressed ourselves through massive demonstrations and resistance to the sheriff officers and there were hundreds and hundreds of arrests so it's not as if we didn't stand against the forces of the law uh, but many many times we would say to the police listen you're doing your job we're doing our job you're going to have to arrest us um, we're not moving um, and the police to be to be fair to them and uh, I wasn't always fair to the police but to be fair to them they didn't want to do it they hated the poll tax as much as us in England um, in particular, not so much in Wales, but in England and particularly in the inner cities of like Bristol and London, a lot of the protests turned into violent protests. Um, and maybe, maybe the desperation of people in a lot of those inner city areas was just so deep that their expression of uh, protest meant that they smashed shop windows um, and they looted. Um, and, uh, you know, people weren't harmed as such, but there was a lot of looting uh, took place. I've got to say, um, looting is sometimes the voice of the dispossessed, um, and what happened on March 31st uh, of 1990 was historic, Alec, because that was the day that the poll tax was supposed to be introduced in England and Wales, and as you know, the whole of London literally went up in flames because the Trafalgar Square as well, the massive demonstration that day was supposed to end. We had one in Glasgow. We marched from Glasgow, uh, from uh, George Square to Queen's Park. Uh, I always remember, Alec, one of the wee um, points of the day that a lot of your Scottish viewers will find of interest. I remember one of our chief stewards in the day, we had massive, with about 40, 50,000 people, it was absolutely massive. Then we had uh, Dave Anderson, Elaine C. Smith, uh, Hugh and Cry, we're all playing, they, oh, they wanted to be part of the campaign. And the chief steward, Big Jack, come up to me, he says, Tommy, Tommy, there's somebody who wants to come up and sing. And I said, oh, look, we've, we're full up, we've got our singing. Aye, it's Ricky Ross. <laughs> And of course, Deacon Blue wanted to come, turned up in the day, wanted to perform. That was the nature of the campaign in Scotland, Alec. It was across anybody who was in any way related to Civic Scotland wanted to be part of the anti poll tax campaign. I flew from London, sorry, from Glasgow to London, um, met my future wife Gail on the plane on the way down, uh, which was a lovely uh, quirk of fate for me. I went to school with her, I hadn't seen her for years. Turns out she was on... Did she uh, give you an extra whisk? Well, what she did do, Alec, what she did do, which was remarkable, I loved her for it, was she, she convinced the captain not to close the doors for an extra 15 minutes, which is really, really difficult when it comes to captains. But I was late getting to the, the, the plane and lo and behold, she was there and she says, you're a lucky boy, I've kept this plane for you. And we chatted away and we made a wee arrangement. I was going to um, see her later that night. It was a lovely day, Alex, uh, but I never ever made it because of course, London went uh, ahead and blew up into a massive riot. And that undermined Thatcher because the Iron Lady who was parading across Poland and everywhere else saying that she was the superwoman, she couldn't be touched. She did even have control of her own capital city. And that riot undermined her fatally. Now, let's bring us right up to date. <clears throat> We're looking at the protests about Gaza. Has that reignited the, the art of, uh, of mass protest? I mean, we've had you know, very vigorous protests on the environment and global warming. But these are the biggest rallies since, uh, well, since Iraq 20 years ago. Yeah, I think that's the best comparison, Alec. Way back in 2003, yourself, myself, we were involved in demonstrations that reached 100,000 in, in Glasgow, well over 200,000 in London. Um, and a lot of people would have felt it didn't work. 
because we didn't stop the illegal, immoral invasion of Iraq. Interesting, of course, that Iraq broke two UN resolutions and was invaded. Israel's broke 63 of them and, and we still give them arms. That's the hypocrisy of the world that we live in. But I think the absolute inhumanity of what has been done to the people of Palestine and Gaza, that has united people in a way that hasn't happened in the last decade. The demonstrations that are taking place, not just in London, not just in Glasgow, but all over the world. The mainstream media isn't given anything like the coverage to it that it deserves. The governments of the West are refusing to criticise and attack Israel for their genocide. But the people of the West are against it completely. And that shows you how out of touch the politicians have become. And out of that, in a world sense, I mean, there may come huge implications. Maybe the revival of the International Court of Justice, with a, an executive arm, maybe a, a reform, reformation of the United Nations. Who knows what might happen? But domestically, uh, you might argue if the poll tax broke Margaret Thatcher, the Iraq War broke the Labour Party in terms of its hegemony in Scotland. What do you think the political impact, looking at domestic politics, of the situation in Gaza is likely to be? Alec, I would love the situation to develop that the absolute genocide, the cold-blooded murder that is happening in Palestine on a daily basis would break the political system in Britain in terms of the Labour Party's hegemony in England and the SNP's hegemony in Scotland. Although, um, I'd appalled by the fact that the SNP haven't furthered the, the cause of independence. But on the question of ceasefire, on the question of standing with Palestine, the SNP have been prepared to make a stand and they deserve to be recognised from that. Your influence and the influence of others is still there in, in that respect. But I think what's happened, Alex, in my opinion, there is a bigger picture going on here. I think the world order is now split asunder. That I think America's influence in the world is now absolutely reduced to the least that it's ever been since the Second World War. I think America and their allegiance to Israel, they have been exposed as nothing more, nothing less than a bunch of lying hypocrites. And now their influence in parts of the world is waned beyond anybody's expectation. The, the BRIC countries, the influence of Russia, of China, the fact that Brazil, South Africa, these nations are now finding their own voice and they're finding that there are alliances to be had. You look at what's happening in Africa and the whole continent of Africa. America is now a, 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 a dirty word in people's mouths. France has been chased out of there. They used to have a colonial uh, uh, settlement there. It is from that point of view that although on the surface it would appear that Israel's getting away with what they want to do, underneath the surface what's really happening is the world is changing. And how much of that, as a final question, will you attribute to the, the politics of protest? I think without those millions of people that are taken to the street all across the world, without that, then the politicians would think they could get away with whatever they want. But that level of protest has forced countries like Belgium, like South Africa, like Ireland, Ireland the other day, unanimously calling for a boycott of Israel, a cessation of arms sales to Israel, expelling the Israel uh, ambassadors from their country. Ireland showing the way, a small country showing the way. We, we here in the UK should be ashamed, Alec. We stop funding the United Nations Human Rights Organization, but we keep selling arms to Israel. That is shame-faced and that is bloodthirsty and we should be ashamed of it. Right, very finally, Tommy, back, back to Scotland. How, how important is that, uh, that marching, that protesting in terms of furthering the political cause of independence, which you and I have proclaimed for many, many years? Alex, you know as well as I do that without protest, without marching, 14th of September 
we are going to have the 10th anniversary, the 10th anniversary of the Hope Over Fear rallies in George Square to announce to the whole of Scotland and the world that we may have lost a referendum in 2014, but we won the argument. We won the hearts and minds of the young people of Scotland, Alex. You know that independence is inevitable because we've won the argument. We have to maintain the pressure by getting people onto the street. You're hopefully going to be addressing that rally. We're going to be marching through Glasgow and we're going to be saying loud and clear in an independent Scotland, we will be with Palestine. We will be against selling guns and arms to Israel. We will stand on the side of the peacemakers, not the warmongers. And will a, a, a young Ricky Ross equivalent suddenly emerge out of the crowd and ask to take a turn on the stage? That would be fine. I'm hoping the proclaimers watch your show. They've been great backers of Hope Over Fear. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the proclaimers were to put in a wee appearance? It would be Tommy Shadow. Thank you so much for joining in Scotland Speaks with Alex Sam. It's been a pleasure. Welcome back. Now, last week's show was also about a protest, this time on the closure of the Grangemouth Refinery. Here's a reminder of the campaign. This isn't just a campaign for Grangemouth, it's about all of Scotland. If this refinery closes, we'll be the only major oil producing nation without a refinery capacity. They'll take our oil from the North Sea, they'll send it abroad to be refined, we'll be charged a premium to bring it back in so we'll pay more at the pumps and we'll lose the skilled jobs. Because what's important here is not just that it's economic lunacy, it's also environmental madness. There'll be far worse environmental consequence by shifting your oil across the, the seas or down south to have it refined than doing it here. So it's a line in the sand. There is a mood amongst the workforce. They're up for the fight because they know how important it is it's a tragedy that the political leadership in Scotland has been so mute. Both Labour and the SNP have been absent, but we've got to put our backbone into them. We've got to get people realising that this is a fight that has to be fought, but it's a fight that we can win. So let's get to it. And this is what you had to say about it. Bran says, save Grangemouth Refinery. Scotland has lost enough over the years to other countries. It's about time the Scottish Government stood its ground and stuck up for Scotland and its people. Try listening to the people. Ian says, nice to see you again speaking up in defence of Scotland. Always, Ian, always. Margaret says, another great show. Thanks for keeping us informed. Shame on the Scottish Government for sitting idly by and letting our refinery close. They will pay for this at the next general election. Ali says 100%, aside from economic benefits, jobs, etc., it's an important part of our history heritage from Scotland's first oil bonanza by James Paraffin Young, who brought jobs to the majority of West Lothian inhabitants 150 years ago. And John says, oil refining is the first stage in producing a number of other products such as plastics. 
these other products could be of great value to post-fossil fuel Scottish economy. And now to Scotland's Hidden Heroes in association with flagship media. Alex continues the theme of protest with the hidden hero and the story of the Turaku. A few years back, I, I was leading a campaign to save a factory in Turaf, a successful campaign, as it turned out. And as part of the, the proceedings, we had a, a rally and a march through the, the town of Turaf in Aberdeenshire. And in the Union Hotel, we had an enthusiastic rally. And in part of my speech, I said this was the biggest demonstration in Turaf, Aberdeenshire, since the general strike. Somebody shouted out, there wasn't a demonstration in the general strike. And somebody else shouted out, but there was one for the Turaku. And that is a, a reminder that political protest is not confined to the urban belt of Scotland. On the contrary, some of the most vigorous protests have occurred in rural Scotland. The, the protests against uh, the landlords and uh, eviction from the land. Uh, the, the protests where people rallied for crofting rights, for example. But in 1913, there occurred a quite extraordinary protest in Turra, the sleepy Aberdeenshire town. A local farmer, Robert Patterson, had organised a, a demonstration and a protest, a non-payment protest against Lloyd George National Insurance Act. He wasn't actually protesting about national insurance, he was protesting about the fact that agricultural workers were paying the same as industrial workers when they were less liable to be off sick and therefore he wanted a lower rate for industrial workers. Anyway, he withheld the insurance tax. And he carried his protest right through uh, until pending and sheriff officers and the rest of it. He actually paid the fine, but he refused to say pay the back taxes. And as a result, the sheriff officers came up to, to seize his uh, belongings. And since nobody in the town would assist him in taking off anything from his farm in Lendrum, Aberdeenshire, they ended up taking away the one possession he had, which was mobile, and that was his a prize dairy coo, his cow. And they took the cow to Turf to have it auctioned, but of course the town by this time were up in arms, so none of the two auction houses, or for that matter any of the citizens of Turf, would assist the auctioneers. There was a, a riot broke out effectively, and the sheriff officers were driven from the town with uh, flour and other uh, assorted uh, goods uh, uh, about, their, uh, about their person. Now, Patterson and some of his uh, supporters were, were taken to Aberdeen Sheriff Court, where, where they were fined, but the jury triumphantly uh, found them all not proven, so they were sent back to Turra in trial. Meanwhile, the coup had been auctioned in Aberdeen uh, and had been bought by a, a, another farmer for uh, seven or, or eight pounds. Whereupon the people of Turriff rallied and bought the coup back for Robert Patterson. And the coup was triumphantly paraded through the town under the slogan from Lendrum to Leaks. Uh, the Leaks being a reference to Lloyd George, uh, whose insurance act it was, Welsh origins. And so this uh, dramatic uh, tale, which is still illustrated in the town of Turriff by a, 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 pretty, a pretty good uh, statue of the, the coup concerned, and the Turaku is a legend which is still emblazoned in the, the local football team and is firmly embedded in local folklore. But it should be a reminder uh, for us today that protest, that political protest, is not the preserve of industrial Scotland. It has also been alive and well in rural Scotland. And it's not that long ago. I actually knew uh, Robert Patterson's daughter when I became a member of Parliament uh, for, for Aberdeenshire. And therefore, I think that Robert Patterson, in this show, which is about the politics of protest, is a worthy addition to our pantheon of Scotland's hidden heroes.
Well, Tommy Sheridan certainly hasn't lost any of his fire. <laughs> 35 years after the poll tax devastation, our Tommy has uh, still got plenty of fire in his belly. But the subject he was talking about, how far the politics of protest actually impinge on mainstream politics, is a fascinating one. I mean, the poll tax was certainly had huge effects. It, it brought down the the government of the omnipotent uh, Margaret Thatcher, more than any other factor, more than the European issue, it was the poll tax, which was Margaret Thatcher's nemesis. Uh, and then in the Iraq protests, certainly the, it didn't avert the war, the rallying of hundreds of thousands of people, that's even a million people rallying uh, against the illegal invasion of Iraq, didn't stop the illegal invasion, uh, but it certainly proved the nemesis of the Labour Party. More than any other factor, the, the reign of Labour over the 13 years from 1997 to 2010 came to an end because of the fissures that were provoked uh, by the illegal invasion of Iraq. So looking at the current popular protest about the slaughter in Gaza, I think Tommy Shedden is probably correct. I think the main effect is going to be international as opposed to on domestic politics, but on domestic politics it will have an impact. Internationally I think it may be hastening a, a, a realignment, a, a, an acceleration of a change in the, the world order, I mean, how trying to establish some sort of order in the world. The, the blatant hypocrisy of much of the Western liberal democracies uh, in allowing the State of Israel to ignore the United Nations resolutions and not intervening to bring to this matter to a, a conclusion before tens of thousands of women and children were slaughtered in Gaza. That is going to have ramifications over the next few decades in terms of how the world order is reassembled. So how does that impact on our, our own campaign for Scottish independence and how do the politics of protest translate into that? Now it should be remembered that we don't have to go back 10 years uh, to the heady days of the referendum campaign to see massive street protests in favour of independence. There were massive street protests under all under one banner five, six years ago when the Scottish Government showed no inclination uh, to engage in uh, an early pursuit of independence. People were on the streets demonstrating, perhaps in a sense, demonstrating for action uh, from their politicians. And how nice it would be if we look forward to the Hope Over Fear rally this September, the 10th anniversary of the referendum. If we could see bringing together both the, the street politics of protest in favour of national independence for our country and a serious political campaign and strategy to get us there. That would be a powerful and potent combination. And perhaps the, uh, the 10th anniversary is exactly the spark that's needed. Perhaps it's a date, perhaps it's the anniversary, perhaps in fact it's 10 years since we came within touching distance of national independence. And perhaps that's what's necessary. That, that 10th anniversary is what is necessary to bring together the politics of street protest with a political strategy which actually makes the objective of independence realisable. Bringing together the politics of the protest of the people uh, with a, a strategic vision to actually realise our ambitions. Ten years ago, uh, I said that the people of Scotland would not be banished back into to the shadows of political importance. The people of Scotland would, uh, because of their rallying during the referendum campaign, would be the motive force that took Scotland to independence. I still believe that. And I think the 10th anniversary might well provide the spark that brings the Scottish independence engine back into life. And now over to Tasmina, who's going to close out the show with her usual aplomb. Well, there can only be one way to close our special programme on the politics of protest. And that, of course, is with a quick look at how some of the leading protesters looked back then in the days of the poll tax and Iraq marches. They haven't changed a bit. Well, that's what they think. And with that, we will see you all next week. As Alex says, a for the fit bar and, of course, before the shopping and on every social media channel you can shake a stick at. So do take care in the meantime and we hope to see you all again next week. This is an exciting time in Scotland's story and understanding our past will help us determine our future.
And with Scotland's voices heard, it charts the way forward. This is Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmond.